Well, I woke up at 3 o'clock this morning, and going through my mind was, Thy word have I hid in mine heart. And I thought about that for a while as I laid there. I couldn't sleep. And so as I laid there, I thought, Thy word have I hid in my heart. And then the passage, the entrance of thy word came into my mind. We're going to talk about these passages tonight. And I thought, ding, it's like the light went on. And so I want to share with you the ponderings, some, some of the things that I, I thought about as I lay there this morning thinking. If you look at the passage here in Psalm 119, verse 105, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Before we move on, I want you to notice that this passage is way up into Psalm 119. Psalm 119 is the longest chapter in the Bible. My friend Don has the entire chapter to song, so maybe someday I can share. It's actually 25 different songs. <clears throat> but it's way up, it's over halfway through Psalm 119. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. I want to challenge you to go home and read Psalm 119 and pay close attention. When you look at each, it's, it's broken down into sections of eight. Each section is a progression. When it starts out, let's just look there. Let's just turn to Psalm 119. And I want to just show you what I'm talking about. Psalm 119, starting with verse 1. This is an individual. He's looking at people who are having an experience with the Lord. And he says, Blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are they that keep His testimonies and that seek Him with the whole heart. They also do no iniquity. They walk in His ways. Thou hast commanded us to keep thy precepts diligently. Verse 5 is so pitiful. Oh, that my ways were directed to keep thy statutes. Then shall I not be ashamed when I have respect unto all thy commandments. And then the decision is made. What's the next two words? I will. I will praise thee with the brightness of heart when I shall have learned thy righteous judgments. What's the next two words? I will. I will keep thy statutes, O forsake me not utterly. And if you look carefully throughout the remainder of this psalm, you'll see a deepening of this experience. You'll see a crying out for knowledge. And then you'll, you'll see this individual beginning to actually have this experience that he's been praying for. And so I just want you, I just wanted to, to add that as a challenge to you to go home and to study this psalm and to see that in there and, and there's a reason for that. As you study that psalm you'll begin to see the progression that a spiritual walk should take in our lives. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. What is the purpose of a lamp? Light the way. Oh, it's pretty obvious, right? To bring light. How is it that the Word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Do we take it like a, a flashlight and shine it on the path in front of us? Is that how it works? I see a few grins. No? That's kind of stupid, isn't it? To expect the Word to do that. It's just a book. Really. It's just words on a page. Isn't it? Lights our path to the Lord. What's that? It lightens our path to the Lord. How? How does it do that? That's Knowledge. what we want to talk Knowledge. about tonight. Okay, you're close. Understanding. What's that? Understanding. Okay, all right. We're getting a little bit of feedback now. <coughs> Psalm 119 verse 11 says, Thy word, the word is a lamp, it's a light to our path. Thy word have I hid in mine heart. What's the rest of that passage? Yeah. 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 That I might not sin against thee. So the word being a lamp has something to do with my behavior, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. How is it that the word is hidden in our heart? What does that mean to hide the word 
in our heart. Does it mean memorize it or just remember like this fella here? That's just the verse that I needed. I'll have to remember that one. Is that what it means to hide the word in your heart? To just remember it? No, you're right. That's not what it means. Well, what about the Pharisees? By the way, this is going to be a short study. Nothing, nothing big. I just wanted us to think about some things. <clears throat> These are um, the, the Hebrew word, and I'm not sure if I'm saying it right. It's right here. Teflon. That's the same as phylacteries. You've probably heard about the term phylacteries. These things, the Hebrews, they actually, as you see, they actually tie them to their head or to their hand. The Pharisees were the ones who did this. They took the law, the, the word, uh, seriously when it says to bind it about your head. Bind it on your hand. They took this seriously. And they believed that this was what God meant. Bind it about your head. Bind it upon your hand. What happens here in your head? That's where you think, right? What happens here? That's where you do, right? Okay. So, but does, does binding the word, by the way, what was contained in those boxes was all four scriptures in the, in the Torah where it says that they're to do this, bind the word in the mind on the, or in, on the head and on the hand. So they took it literally. But is that what it meant? Is that what it means to hide the word in our heart? By the way, one of the things as I was studying this this morning, one of the things that I learned about the Pharisees is very interesting. This is a, a point that you might want to remember. I learned this from the Encyclopedia Britannica. I'll just read it. The priestly Pharisees taught that the written Torah was the only source of revelation. The Pharisees admitted the principle of evolution in the law. In other words, they, they took the, the written law and then an oral or a customary law. Okay, and it, They believed that men must use reason in interpreting the Torah and applying it to contemporary problems. That should sound very familiar. Hmm. Actually, what the Pharisees believed is that the law should be interpreted culturally. In other words, we've got to be culturally relevant. We've got to have seeker-sensitive services. This was the mindset of the Pharisees. So if you think of that and remember that, who today would be Pharisees? Those who believe that the law needs to be interpreted culturally instead of those who believe it is written means it is written. Okay, Signs of the Times, March 21, 1878. This is taken from paragraph 5. Do we want to hide the word in our heart after the pattern of the Pharisees? Let's read this together. The condition of the Pharisees should be a lesson to the Christian world of the present day. It should open their eyes to the power of Satan to deceive human minds when they, what's that next word? Once. once. When they once turn from the precious light of the truth and yield to the control of the enemy. Many who make exalted professions today are following in the track of the Pharisees. Once yield, once turn from precious light. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Once turn from it is written, and we don't know where we will end up. And we'll look at that again a little bit later. So I think it's a given that we don't really want to follow the example of the Pharisees in binding boxes around our head or tying them on our hand. That, that can't be what the Bible means when it says to bind it on your head, bind it on your hand. So, who is our example in all things? Christ. Jesus. So, as a youth, did you know that Jesus often quoted, it is written, from Psalm 119 when he was tempted? Very interesting. I, I, I think that's one of the reasons I like Psalm 119 so much because there's a little bit of a connection there for me. So, I want to, let's take a, a, a look at the the life of Christ as a young man as he faced temptation. This is taken from Desire of Ages, page 89. This, this is going to be like four slides here, so try to stay with me. 
<clears throat> this Arved is page 89. There were some who sought his society, feeling at peace in his presence, but many avoided him because they were rebuked by his stainless life. Young companions urged him to do as they did. He, he was bright and cheerful and they enjoyed his presence and welcomed his ready suggestions. But they were impatient at his scruples and pronounced him narrow and straight-laced. Jesus answered, It is written, Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto, by paying attention to his ways and what he does according to the word. And in other words, he compares his life and his actions to it is written. That's how the way is cleansed. Thy word, Jesus said, as Jesus is quoting here, thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. This is the result. When Jesus hid the word in his heart, he was asked often, I think I'm, I missed one. No, I didn't. Okay. Often he was asked, why are you bent on being so singular, so different from us all? It is written, he said, blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are they that keep his testimonies and that seek him with the whole heart. They also do no iniquity. They walk in his ways. Did you notice the things that happened to Jesus? as he used the scripture, Psalm 119, in defense of his actions, having hidden the word in his heart, what were some of the things that happened to him? People became impatient with him? Was he mocked? Was he made fun of? Okay, so what was and what is the difference between Jesus and the Pharisee? What's the difference? Psalm 119, verse 130. The entrance of thy word giveth light. It giveth understanding to the simple. So, thy word is a lamp unto my feet. But to whom really is the word a lamp to their feet? What does it say? It's those who allow the word what? Entrance. Into the heart, yes. I think of that picture of Jesus standing by the door knocking. <coughs> yeah. Running in. We have the door up, don't we? And who is the Word? Christ. Who is the light? Christ. And so that's a very good illustration, you know, with the door up and Christ knocking, wanting to come in. The entrance of thy Word giveth light. It giveth understanding to the simple. What does that word mean? Entrance. Entrance. Mm -hmm. You gave a good illustration. I always like to use the illustration of the seed. When we put a seed in the soil, we cover it up. It takes part of what is in the soil. It's hidden in there. It becomes one with the soil. Like Christ should become when we put Him, hide Him in our hearts. So He should, he should become planted in our hearts like these seeds are planted in the soil, right? And then what happens? What's this say? It will spring forth into new life. Okay? So that's a difference. Did the Pharisees have new life? No. They didn't, did they? Okay. So what then is the difference between memorization of the Word, which we're going to start doing some more memorization. I've asked the children if they would take over. Uh, I want them to pick four passages for each of our doctrines, and let's go through and memorize those together, because that's important. Mm, amen. Then we can meditate on that, okay? But what's the difference between just memorizing the Word and hiding the Word in our hearts? Is there a difference? And is that difference important? Does it make a difference? If God's Word, and I, I really appreciate this picture, if God's Word is only in our minds and not in, us, in our hearts, we'll soon see our steps slide right back into our besetting sins over and over and over. We may know what the Bible says, but we won't be able to do what the Bible says unless the Word has gained entrance into the heart. 
So there's a big difference between the head and the heart. Psalm 37 verse 31 says, The law of his God is in his heart, and none of his steps shall slide. So when the law is truly in our hearts, what's the promise? None of his steps shall slide. You're awfully quiet today. When the law is truly in our heart, what is the promise? The salvation. He will keep us. He will keep us. None of our steps will slide. Our, the Word needs to become our conviction and not our preferences. I had a situation one time I was talking with an employer and, uh, or with an employee and they were, they were telling me about um, a situation they were acquainted with, a fellow employee of mine, and they were saying that um, they had an interview one time, this friend of theirs had an interview one time and their employer asked them about their preferences because they told them they were, they were Sabbath keepers. Well, they told them, it is my preference not to work on the Sabbath. They didn't get the job. Well, the preference doesn't mean you really want it, that you can slide by. That's right, you can slide by a preference. And, but and what happens... Work. Yep. What happens with convictions, though? You won't. You'll say no. You'll say no. Yes. I think of two, and maybe you're getting to it if you are. Forgive me. But it's okay. Um, when Christ was tempted, he did say, It is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word. And so when we live according to that word, it becomes life to us. That's right. That's the difference, I think. That's right. That's right. Preferences can be given up. Mm -hmm. Convictions... You die for. Amen. You die for your convictions. Yes. Jesus said in John twelve thirty five, and here's a here's a, a warning for us. <clears throat> Yet a little while is the light with you. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness come upon you. For he that walketh in darkness knoweth not whether he goeth. And so when light comes to us, when the Lord brings some new truth or some you know, new understanding to us. If we don't walk in that, what happens? We're darkness. We're it rejecting the light. Pardon? We're rejecting that light. We're, we're rejecting it. That's, and that's a good point. If, if the Lord brings light and we don't accept it and walk in it, then we're rejecting it by default. And that takes me into my next passage here that I want to share. This is taken from Desire of Ages 324. We're almost done. We don't have a, a lot longer to go. This is just a brief study and something I wanted to share. Desire of Ages 324. This is probably one of my favorite passages in the entire spirit of prophecy because it's so full of instruction. When the soul surrenders itself to Christ, a new power takes possession of a new heart. That is what it means. When you hide the Word of God in your heart, you not only get power, you get a new heart. <clears throat> when the soul surrenders itself to Christ, a new power takes possession of a new heart, a change. Does it change you just to memorize a scripture? Mm -mm. Does that change you? No. Did you change when you married Suzanne? Are you the same man? I can tell you, he's not the same man. <laughs> he's not. There's been a change. There's another part to him now. A change is wrought which man can never accomplish for himself. It is a supernatural work, bringing a supernatural element into human nature. The soul that is yielded, this is all part of hiding the word in the heart. The soul that is yielded to Christ becomes his own Fortress. Do you want to be a fortress for Christ? Amen. Amen. Did you realize He can view you as a fortress in this world? Which He holds in a revolted world and He intends that no authority shall be known in that heart but His own. It is written. A soul thus kept in possession by heavenly agencies. What it, read this with me. Is... Impregnable. impregnable to the assaults of Satan. How can you not walk in victory? 
Victory is a given when the word is truly hidden in our hearts. Amen. It's a given. It's not a I gotta. It's I get to. But unless we do yield ourselves to the control of Christ, we shall be dominated. Those are strong words. We shall be dominated by the wicked one. We must inevitably be under the control of one or the other of the two great powers that are contending for the supremacy of the world. Who are those powers? Hmm. Christ and Satan. Christ and Satan. It is not necessary for us to deliberately choose the service of the kingdom of darkness in order to come under its dominion. We have only to neglect, to ally ourselves with the kingdom of light. If we do not cooperate with the heavenly agencies, Satan will take possession of the heart and will make it his abiding place. The only defense against evil is the indwelling of Christ in the heart through faith in His righteousness. Unless we become vitally connected. What does that word vitally mean? What is vitally connected? Life. Only. Life. Life. We're connected here in this room, but we're not vitally connected. To be vitally connected means He is my life support. My life stems from Him. A vital union. Unless we become vitally connected with God, we can never resist the unhallowed effects of self-love, self-indulgence, and temptation to sin. We may leave off many bad habits. For the time, we may part company with Satan. But without a vital connection with God, through surrender of ourselves to Him, how often? What does that say? Moment by moment, we shall be overcome. Without a personal acquaintance with Christ and a continual communion, we are at the mercy of the enemy and shall do His bidding in the end. That is a powerful passage, a very loaded and very full of instruction. Christ Object Lessons, page 312. When we submit ourselves to Christ, this is what it means to hide Christ in our heart, hide that word in our heart. When we submit ourselves to Christ, the heart is united with His heart. The will is merged in His will. The mind becomes one with His mind. The thoughts are brought into captivity with Him. Finish the last phrase. We, we live, live his, life. his life. We live his life. <clears throat> Impossible, they say. Impossible. But is it? Yes. It's it is written. Through the blood of Christ. It is written. Isaiah chapter 30, verse 21. The Lord promises that our ear would hear a word behind us saying this is the way when that word is hidden in our heart and we come to a temptation this is the way don't go that way this is the way walk ye in it thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee and now I want to give a warning Troy shared this passage with Kaylin yesterday I think and uh, it's a very pertinent warning in the light of what we're talking about it's about King Solomon, Prophets and Kings, page 55. So gradual was Solomon's apostasy that before he was aware of it, he had wandered far from God. Now, wrap your mind around that. He was far from God and he wasn't even aware. Now, let me ask you, are you safe? Are you safe? <clears throat> Am I safe? What did that passage in Desire of Ages say? Moment by moment. Moment by moment. So gradual was Solomon's apostasy that before he was aware of it, he had wandered far from God. Almost imperceptibly, he began to trust less and less in divine guidance and blessing and to put confidence in his own strength. Little by little. little. He withheld from God that unswerving obedience which was to make Israel a peculiar people. And he conformed more and more closely to the customs of the surrounding nation. Let me tell you, the pull of custom is strong. 
And if we don't consciously resist, we will imperceptibly join up. Follow. That's right. Yielding to the temptations incident to his success and his honored position, he forgot the source of his prosperity. An ambition to excel all other nations in power and grandeur led him to pervert to selfish purposes the heavenly gifts hitherto employed for the glory of God. The money, which should have been held in sacred trust for the benefit of the worthy poor and the extension of holy principles of holy living throughout the world was selfishly absorbed in ambitious projects, engrossed in an overmastering desire to surpass other nations in outward display, the king overlooked the need of acquiring beauty and perfection of character. Moment by moment, <clears throat> the light went out from Solomon's heart, and he recovered. The way back was hard. But there were souls strewn in that man's path. And do you know what? If you and I don't keep our eyes fixed moment by moment, some soul that's watching us may lose their way because of us. <clears throat> I don't know about you, but I don't want that on my record. There's enough souls in my path strewn along the path because of my mistakes. I don't want that anymore. We're writing the pages of our own history right now. What are we writing on those pages? Proverbs chapter 6, verse 20 to 22. My son, keep thy father's commandments and forsake not the law of thy mother. Bind them continually upon thine heart and tie them about thy neck. When thou goest, it shall lead thee. When thou sleepest, it shall keep thee. And when thou awakest, it shall talk with thee. For the commandment, verse 23, is a lamp, and the law is light. Finish that. Reproofs of instruction are the way of life. Now, I want you to raise your hand if you like reproof. One good man that's willing to raise his hand, I like reproof. You know what? It doesn't feel good. But you know, we can like it by faith because I know that this is what's going to keep me in the path of life. Reproofs of instruction are the way of life. The Upward Look, page 129. True Christians are faithful in little things, remembering that the Word of God declares, He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. A faithful Steady obedience to the words of Christ makes men, what? Pure. Pure in mind, resolute in purpose, and faithful in every station of life. Yes. Is it true that there are some things that are not salvational issues? What do you say? I say nay. Right there. Whatever the Lord tells us to do is a salvational issue. Let me ask you something. When Uzzah reached over and steadied the ark, was it a salvational issue? Yes. Definitely. When when Lot's wife and they were leaving Sodom and she did this, yes. was that a salvational issue? Yes. Anything that the Lord says do, that we choose not to do, that's a salvational issue. Desire of Ages 382. Day by day, God instructs His children by the circumstances of the daily life, He is preparing them to act their part upon that wider stage to which His providence has appointed them. Listen carefully. This is important. It is the issue of the daily test that determines their victory or defeat in life's great crisis. Did you realize that when you're tempted to eat something that you shouldn't, you are preparing for your victory or failure in the great crisis at the end. Every temptation that you meet is preparing the way for ultimate failure or ultimate victory. If we are day by day hiding the Word in our heart, and I t I've told you I'm studying brain physiology, and the reason I'm doing that is because I want to know what goes on in our heads when we face temptation? What was going on in the brain of Jesus in Gethsemane 
Was it just all of a sudden in Gethsemane that he was able to endure? Or was it the issue of the daily test? Hebrews said he was made perfect by the things that he suffered. So the issue of your daily test and how you deal with it, how you think about it, is going to determine the ultimate outcome of your life. And so, I just want to encourage each one of us not to be casual with the Word of God, but the things that He's shared with us, the light that He's given us, truly hide it in your heart. And what that means is it becomes part of you. You don't have to stop and think, uh, what's the right thing to do? You know, it's in there. We may have to study. There may be things that we don't understand. Yes, we have to study. But when the heart is surrendered, the Lord promised, your ear will hear a word behind you saying, this is the way. Walk ye in it. So I just want to encourage us to be diligent in hiding the Word of God in our heart, surrendering to Christ. When light comes, walk in it. Let's pray.